Hi, we're on our range, and today is part four in our four-part series on mass shootings. Important side note, there is no part three. Don't ask. Now, just about a week ago, in Indiana, at a place called the Greenwood Park Mall, there was what would have been a mass shooting, but a citizen was able to cut that short. And since then, a lot of people have contacted me asking me a lot of questions about making 40-yard shots and ways to improve your chances of making 40-yard shots. People have asked me for an in-depth analysis of that occurrence. And people have asked me questions about whether citizens really should come to the aid of other citizens in a situation like that. So today we'll discuss and demonstrate some of those things. Now, before I even get started, two very important things. One, I can't do too much of an in-depth analysis of that situation because I wasn't there and I don't have a lot of inside information. Two, as far as whether citizens in a mass shooting situation should intervene to protect other innocent people, we'll discuss that a little more later. But to start with, I'm going to say this. There was a movie, and it wasn't a particularly good movie, but Sean Connery said something, and I'll get the quote close to right. He said, We pray that God will give us the wisdom to know what's right, the will to choose it, and the strength to make it endure. I'm going to paraphrase that, and I'm going to say, We should thank God that there was a citizen there that had the wisdom to know what's right, the courage to attempt it, and the tools and the talent to carry it out successfully. Now that having been said, what about making 40-yard shots? Can you do it? How easy is it to do it? Ways you can improve on that. Let's go to the target. When it comes to concealed carry, some people will carry full-sized handguns like this Beretta 92FS, but most people don't. They're going to carry something smaller. This is a Smith & Wesson Bodyguard in caliber 380 ACP. It's very similar in size to the Ruger LCP in caliber 380 ACP, both of which are common, they're fairly popular, and this is more representative of the size of firearms most people are carrying for concealed carry. Now, I have two targets set up at seven yards. Remember, the FBI spent decades telling us that seven yards was the mean distance for a lethal confrontation. And I'm going to shoot these targets with the Smith & Wesson Bodyguard, and I'll shoot left, right, left, right. That'll simulate multiple targets or a moving target, and I'm going to shoot by the standard of as fast as I think I can hit. Let's see how I do. Okay, let's try another concealed carry handgun. This is a Beretta Model 21A in caliber 25 ACP. Let's see how I do with this. Let's take a look at the targets. Here's our two targets. I fired three shots each with the 380, and we can see that in both cases, the shot placement is absolutely acceptable. Now, with the 25, I was shooting at the heads of the targets. Remember, with little calibers like 22 long rifle and 25 ACP, proper shot placement is very important. Let's take a close up look at these impacts. And on this target, I fired four shots, and they're in no particular order one, two, three, four. So that's good shot placement. On our other target, I fired four shots, and in no particular order, one, two, three, four. Now that is touching the edge. That is technically a hit, but it's only a hit in the sense of requiring our target to need a comb over. So we see that at seven yards, this little gun in the hands of the average shooter is delivering absolutely adequate accuracy. But in the wake of the Greenwood Mall shooting, the question comes up, what if I had to shoot farther? Could I achieve the necessary accuracy with this little gun? Let's put that to the test. Now we'll do the same drill, left, right, left, right, as fast as I think I can hit, but from a distance of 20 yards. And we'll start with the bodyguard. And now let's see how we do with the Beretta 21A.
Now, the first thing we see is I was shooting a lot slower, but let's go take a look at the targets. So with the 380, I fired three shots at each target, and in no particular order, they're one, two, three. On our other target, one, two, three. Is that sufficient accuracy? I'm going to say yes, but we saw it took me quite a bit longer to achieve it. Now, with the 25, again, I'm shooting for the right portion of the target. Let's take a look at our impacts here. And in no particular order, they are one, two, three, four. And on our other target, we see one, two, three, four. Now, I have to point out that this group I got with the 25 is a fairly good group. Had I been aiming center mass, they all would have been hits. But that brings up the debate with a 25 at 20 yards shooting for torso hits, are we going to get sufficient effect? And that's a debate for another time. But for today, the accuracy standard that I'm holding shooting at this particular part of the target, with the 25, I am not getting sufficient accuracy. But even though we're getting sufficient accuracy with the 380 at 20 yards, what if we had to shoot farther? Let's try this again at 40 yards. And of course, we saw that the Beretta 21A was delivering insufficient accuracy at 20 yards. But let's try with the Smith & Wesson Bodyguard from 40 yards. Let's take a look at the target. I fired three shots at each target, and our shot holes are, in no particular order, one, two, three, four, five, six. Absolutely insufficient accuracy. But is that because that gun won't shoot accurately at that distance, or maybe just I can't shoot accurately at that distance? Let's paste up our shot holes and put that to the test. Now I have my Smith & Wesson Model 638. It's a five-shot revolver, caliber 38 special with a one and seven-eighths inch barrel. Let's shoot from 40 yards left, right, left, right with this and see how I do. Let's take a look at the target. In looking at these targets, there's one very important thing we have to remember. It's a five shot revolver, so when I'm shooting left, right, left, right, left, it ends up with three shots on one target, two on the other. I reload, repeat that drill. And so of our 10 shots, we end up with six on one target, four on the other. And if we look at our impacts in no particular order, they are one, two, three, four, five, six. On this target, one, two, three, four. Now this shows us a few things. The first being the downside of, to achieve this accuracy, I had to shoot kind of slowly, and it's only a five shot revolver, I had to reload to get my 10 shots out. But the two really upsides are, one, it shows us that this revolver at this distance is capable of fairly good accuracy, and it shows us that the combination of this revolver and this shooter is working fairly well. Now I put up a new target, but this one does not have any kind of center. It's just the same color all the way through. And I'm going to do a drill where at a distance of 40 yards, I fire 10 shots in a time limit of 15 seconds coming from concealment, which in my case is just my pocket. Now, two very important things. One, I have been shooting left, right, left, right. No, in this case, there's only one target. And two, this drill that's come into existence in the very recent past has been given a name. I did not come up with this. People are calling it the Dickon drill. Well, I don't know if he really wants his name associated with it, so I'm just going to call it the Greenwood Drill. And I'll fire on command from my cameraman. Okay, whenever you're ready. Fire. Fourteen seconds. Okay, not bad, but let's take a look at the target. Well, here's our target, and our ten shot holes are, in no particular order, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. 
So at a distance of 40 yards, 10 shots, 10 hits. There's a question I've been asked a lot in the very recent past, and that is doing something like the Greenwood drill where you're trying to hit a target at 40 yards with your pistol, would you be better off to take the extra time it takes to get some kind of stabilization platform? Now, moving outside the specific example of the Greenwood drill, because you probably wouldn't have your pickup in the food court, but in other cases, would you be better off using the hood of a vehicle as a stabilization platform? Okay, typically what I would say is, instead of leaning on it, I'd want to be back from it, because this is more mobile than this. Also, if I'm using this as cover, if I'm back from it, I can just duck. If I'm leaning on it, then I have to step back and duck, and it takes more time. But when you're trying to make a handgun shot at a particularly long distance, would the advantages of a stabilization platform outweigh the advantages of mobility and being able to duck? Well, let's do our Greenwood drill again, using the hood of the pickup as a stabilization platform, and see how well we do in terms of time and hits on the target. Okay, anytime you're ready. Fire. What's our time? 18 and a half seconds. 18 and a half definitely took me longer. But let's look at the target. Well, here's our target. I fired 10 shots and our hits are in no particular order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Is that better than what I had before? Marginally, maybe. And it definitely took longer and cost me mobility. Now we'll try that drill again using a table. Of course, the table will not be any kind of cover and not really any kind of concealment, just a stabilization platform. But let's see if it helps. Remember, you're ready. Fire. Now let's take a look at the target. So using the hood of the pickup as a stabilization platform, 18 seconds. Using the table, 15 seconds. Are these groups any better than what I got shooting offhand? A little bit, maybe. But they cost me in one case time and mobility, and in the other case just mobility. But what we're really seeing here is whether or not you're going to do any better shooting from some kind of stabilization is really going to depend on the shooter and the firearm. And one thing I can absolutely tell you is that shooting fast does not help you if you miss. Accuracy always trumps speed. So what can we take away from shooting all of those targets? Well, we saw that with the wrong combination of shooter and firearm, such as me trying to shoot this Smith & Wesson bodyguard, making those longer shots was something I just wasn't able to do. But with the right combination, such as me with the Smith & Wesson Model 638, I was able to make those shots. And so what I would tell anybody about the concept of what kind of training you should do and what kind of practice you should do when it comes to trying to make those longer shots with your handgun, I would say start with getting your concealed carry handgun, going to the range and shooting it at a distance of 10 yards. Based on that, try 20. Based on that, try 30. Based on that, try 40. And if with your gun you're getting groups like this at 20 and then you go out to 40 and you're just not hitting the target, obviously there's something wrong there. You might have to sandbag your pistol to make sure that it's hitting where you think it will at that distance. Maybe have someone else try to shoot it and see if it's capable of shooting accurately at that distance. You might just have to do a lot more training with that pistol at that distance. And if all of those things don't work, you just might have to get a different firearm. Now, when we talk about concealed carry handguns, a lot of people will carry particular firearms because they're convenient. This handgun is very easy to carry. The problem is it doesn't do what I need it to do when I need it. 
And so you have to create a balance between program compliance, as in getting a gun that's easy to carry so you will comply with the program of carrying it, versus one that does what you need it to do. And what is the right balance? No one can decide that for you but you. Now once we talk about can you make those shots at that distance, then the question comes up, should you? In the very recent past, I've been asked a lot of questions about should you try to defend yourself against a mass shooter? Should you try to come to the aid of others in a mass shooting situation? What might you expect to happen if you do those things? Let's discuss that. In discussing the topic of whether or not you should come to other people's aid when a mass shooting occurs, there's two caveats that I want to start with. One, I'm going to use this recent Greenwood incident to illustrate some of my points. And in saying that, I must remind everyone that I was not there. Some people who were in that mall, not necessarily for the event, but were in that mall, have sent me photos, and so I've seen some of the layout of what's going on. But I was not there. I can only tell you what I've seen on the news and what I've read, and that's not always accurate. Secondly, I must point out that I have never met the citizen in that case who came to other people's aid. I've not met him, I have not talked to him, I do not know him at all. Okay, that having been said, when you're in a situation where you find yourself on the wrong end of a mass shooting, and I'm going to add to that that bullets aren't flying at you right that second. You can hear or see what's going on, but you're not in danger right that second. A good course of action for a lot of people might be to run as fast as you can out of that area. If you do, no one's going to vilify you unless, let's say, you're a police officer, then they probably will and perhaps they should. Also, if you're one of those people who likes to talk a lot of big talk about all the things you've never really done and you say the phrase, well, what I would have done was, if you're one of those people, and this happens to be the once-in-a-lifetime moment of truth for you, and you run out the back, yeah, everybody's going to remember that, and everybody's going to judge you for it, and you're going to have to live with that. But for those of us who don't talk a mountain of trash, running out the back might be a good idea. And I'm going to reiterate my suggestion that you watch the presentation titled, Run, Hide, Fight. Okay, but all that having been said, if you decide to come to the aid of other people, there are a lot of things that you need to take into consideration. Some of which you're going to have to stop and think about right that moment as things are happening. And there could be many things on this list of what you need to think about, but I'm going to hit what I call my top five. And number one is, when you see something happening, you have to ask yourself, is that mass shooter really a mass shooter? Now, in a case like the Greenwood Mall, where most people became aware of it when they heard the gunfire and looked and saw him shooting at people, well, answering that question wasn't too difficult. But sometimes it can be, and it can be time-consuming to answer the question. Sometimes even when gunfire is happening, you have to ask, okay, is that the police trying to effect an arrest, or is it a mass shooter? And sometimes you might sit for crucial seconds that seem like hours waiting for events to unfold so you can answer that, is this really a mass shooting? Now, a lot of times what will happen is you're in the Walmart parking lot and you see somebody get out of his car with an AR platform, start walking toward Walmart, and you think it's a mass shooter when it's really just a kid who bought an airsoft gun that was defective and now he's returning it. You have to be sure that your mass shooter is really a mass shooter. Even if it looks like that to everyone and you end up killing a non-uniformed police officer who's trying to effect an arrest, that is something you're not going to want to live with and legally no one else is going to let you live with it. You're going to find yourself in a lot of trouble and it's a situation that you must take extreme steps to avoid. You've got to be sure, even if it takes a little while for you waiting for events to unfold. Now the second thing on my list is you have to ask yourself the question, is the lone gunman really alone? In mass shootings like this, the perpetrator is most of the time by themselves, but not always. And again, you have to take the time it takes to make sure of that. 
Now, in some cases, you might not have the time it takes because people are being shot right that second, but anytime you can, you have to. A really good example of this is you go over to Active Self Protection. John has a video that was taken at Walmart that illustrates my point very well, and it's just very difficult to watch. But I suggest you do. Now, the very short version of it is from what I can see on the video, someone walks into Walmart and he's armed and he shoots his gun up in the air or something, starts yelling some kind of stuff. A citizen sees that, citizen is armed, pulls out his own firearm and starts following what he perceives is going to be a mass shooter or at least somebody that's gonna cause some trouble. So our citizen is doing the right thing of making sure that this is a mass shooter, but he didn't check to see that the lone gunman was alone. Now, keep in mind, I am not critiquing or criticizing what he did. I applaud that he had the willingness to try to come to the aid of other people. And if I were in that situation, I probably would have made the exact same mistake. But let's all learn from that mistake. And what happened was, as he's following that mass shooter, or at least what he thought might become one, the perpetrator's accomplice came up behind our citizen, shot him from behind, and killed him. You have to make sure that the lone gunman is really alone, even if it takes those crucial extra seconds that seem like hours. Now, third on my list is you have to ask yourself the question, and you can't ask it ahead of time. You have to ask yourself the question right that moment, can you engage the mass shooter without being mistaken for being the mass shooter? Now, in our Greenwood case, where our citizen sees what's going on, I don't know what he took time to stop and think about, but while we're seeing a lot of violent action right that second, he acted very quickly. But that's not always going to be the case. Sometimes you might be, not in this place, 40 yards away from the perpetrator. He might be 50, 60, 70 yards farther away and only hear the shooting and then have to go toward it. So if you're somewhere far away, you hear shooting going on, sounds like a mass shooter, do you want to pull out your firearm and run toward that to come to the aid of other citizens? What happens is, as he goes by, and I heard the shooting too, so I step out of the Cinnabon, and all I know is I heard shooting and I see you with a gun. So I think you're the mass shooter, I engage you, while somebody else thinks I'm the mass shooter and engages me, and that could get stupid really fast. And you have to ask yourself the question, can you engage the mass shooter without being mistaken for being the mass shooter? You also have to create a balance between doing that and what ifing yourself so badly that you sit there and do nothing. Sometimes you have to think about a lot of things in a very short time. But this is a question that you have to ask. Now the fourth thing on my list is, can you engage the mass shooter while maintaining an acceptable level of risk to innocent bystanders? And that's part of the point of our shooting demonstration earlier was that we see that I can, with the right firearm, and taking as long as I need to shoot and get the hits, yes, I can hit the target at 40 yards away. But there are people who can't. And so if your mass shooter is there, maybe just right pretty close to an innocent bystander, can you hit the intended target without hitting the innocent bystander? And of course, no one can answer the, that except you. And you really have to stop and think can you engage the mass shooter with an acceptable level of risk? Now, this is where I have to talk about something called net gain. I buy something for $10, so I've spent 10, I sell it for 30, so now I have a net gain of 20. That sounds great, and all of that stuff like you can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs, advertising doesn't cost, it pays, it takes money to make money. Okay, there's some level of truth to all of those things. That does not apply here. Even if something really looks like it's going to become like the Sandy Hook incident or the Uvalde incident where 20 plus people are going to be killed. And so you see what's going on and the mass shooter shoots three people and then you can take out the mass shooter, but oh, you accidentally killed an innocent bystander. So four innocent people have been killed. And we can look and say, well, if you hadn't intervened, it would have been 20. So you have a net gain of 16. No, it doesn't work that way you will have a great deal of difficulty living with yourself having killed an innocent bystander. 
There will also be a lot of social and legal ramifications of that and you're going to find yourself in a lot of trouble and a situation that you just don't want to live with being in. You really have to ask yourself, can you engage that mass shooter while maintaining an acceptable level of safety for citizens? And you have to answer that question honestly. Now, that brings me to point five, and I could be here all day just talking about point five. And that is, if you come to the aid of other people, are you ready to deal with the legal, social, political, economic ramifications of your actions? In the case of the Greenwood incident, what we see is it was all on video, and that's a big plus, so just exactly what happened isn't too hard to figure out. And we also see the police figuring out what happened, telling the straight version of it, supporting our citizen, and I applaud law enforcement for doing that. But we've also all seen cases where law enforcement didn't act with such responsibility where they had a narrative and tried to hide the evidence that didn't fit their narrative. And you have to be prepared that that kind of thing just might happen to you. You also have to be prepared for the reality that the mainstream media, newspapers, online sources, when they report the so-called news, they get things wrong just about as often as they get things right. And Again, I could sit here all day just talking about that. But again, in the recent past, the Uvalde incident, the day that happened, the version of events was that an off-duty DEA agent was in the area, heard the gunfire, ran into the school, and single-handedly took out the gunman. Yeah, that didn't happen, but that's what was reported. And even though later that was corrected, in a lot of cases, it's not. You also have to deal with that people will, even the people who know you and who should know better, will read a newspaper article about you and believe it, even though those are the people who tell you don't believe what you read in the paper. I must reiterate that I have never met the citizen from the Greenwood Mall incident. But from what I'm reading, the perpetrator in that case was 20 years old. Our citizen was 22 years old. But I've seen those transposed. And although I've never met this citizen, I'm going to bet that he has, in the last week or so, had to deal with a lot of this. Gee, I didn't know you were only 20 years old. I'm not. Remember, we graduated high school together. We're the same age. I'm going to bet he's had that conversation or conversations like it several times in the last week. Because people who should know better will read something negative and believe it. And you've got to be prepared for that kind of thing to happen. So the takeaways from everything today. Well, as I said at the beginning, I can't do a really good in-depth analysis of the Greenwood Park Mall shooting because I wasn't there and I don't have any real true insider information. But we did discuss shooting at 40 yards and some things you can do to improve your chances of getting the hits at 40 yards. And we talked about my top five questions you need to ask yourself before intervening on someone else's behalf in a mass shooting situation. And I'm going to reiterate those. One, are you sure the mass shooter is really a mass shooter? Two, are you sure the lone gunman is really alone? Three, can you engage the mass shooter without being mistaken for being the mass shooter? Four, can you engage the mass shooter while maintaining the necessary level of safety to innocent bystanders? And five, are you ready for all the fallout? So if you've paid attention through this entire presentation, thank you for your indulgence. And as always, don't try this at home on what you call a professional. And thanks for watching Mass Shootings Part 4.